chat back up, I think. Maybe. All right. Hopefully you guys can see my slides and I'm not blanking everything out with my chat box. Uh, if there's problems, go ahead and drop me a note or unmute and let me know. Hi, everybody. I'm Elsie. Um, welcome to my, my talk and my meanderings where I show you guys how I work through using art to access driving practices and, and kind of inform folks about what they did or maybe sometimes what they may have done uh, and, and go through and double check some of the assumptions that are easy to bring to the table when you start off as a modern driver. Uh, so a bit of my background, there's a couple of you on here that, that know me and have seen me drive, but I don't drive in the SCA often. I actually grew up showing uh, Welsh ponies, hackneys occasionally, really did the core of my activities uh, as part of the pleasure driving competitions and coaching things on the West Coast. I started off with a stable as a junior driver in a stable that had Welsh ponies. We did single pair unicorn four and hair, hand tandem and random. Uh, and I enjoyed driving all of those hitches. <coughs> And I had amazing mentors to work with who were very much focused in on the practical aspects behind the fashion. When we you were working on very late 19th century, early 20th century vehicles at the time, uh, we would look at the appointments and the fashion and how you were supposed to turn out. And, and one of the biggest take home messages I got from, from growing up and having that introduction was that when you're taking something that is a practical aspect that someone needs, even when there are elements of fashion and showing wealth, that practical application is functionally at the bottom of most things. You know, these days I have a great truck. When I go out truck shopping, I want F2, well, now I've got an F350. I have a big horse trailer I need to pull. I want an eight foot bed because I need to be able to put a sheet of plywood in it. I want leather seats because it's easier to clean up after the dogs than on cloth. And I want a crew cab because my husband is 6'3 and we don't have any cars. So this, this has to be both my car and my, and my truck for getting things done. And I want a diesel because I drive 40 to 50,000 miles a year and I need that diesel endurance in addition to needing the power to tow. When you look at my truck, it's a really pretty blue truck. And there's a lot of very pretty fashion to it. But there's actually some very practical reasons that I make the choices that I do in what I do. So I try to always keep that in the back of my mind as I start to look at art and look at the options that are out there and trying to get into the mindset for those time periods where we don't have extant pieces left or even if we do have extant vehicles, we may not have the horse that goes with it, or we don't have them hitched in place, or we don't actually have the visual of how they drove it because it's out of a burial. So we, we have to try to come up with the best frog DNA we can. This is just a quick shout out for the uh, Facebook group you've heard mentioned a few times that's been dropped in the comments. These are actually photos of our file sections. So if there's something you guys are curious about, we may at least have a starting place for you to go take a look at things. I think the most common question that I get is, where do I go to for resources? Is a starting place, this is, this is a compilation. There's some other good ones out there. There are some blogs that have been put together that are very good. You know, Google can get you off to a good start. The Wikipedia pages will often have references in the bottom, or you may have a Wiki Commons image that then actually has a, a date with it and stuff like that. So I'm going to take you guys through and not only highlight some of the things that step out to me in these artistic pieces, but also touch upon the things that you guys can keep in mind to help get yourselves to the best answers possible, that you, the, the answers you're looking for, for the questions that you have. 
So we're gonna go ahead and start with these two images. Uh, I, I really like both of these pieces from the perspective of they look to me like the carriage driving I grew up with. We've got someone sitting up on the box seat, the reins are in the left hand, the whip is in the right hand, the harness pieces all seem to be there. There are lovely sets of horses. The biggest challenge that I have with both of these two pieces for my own research, I do, I do mostly 15th and 16th century research. Um, I dabble across the centuries, but those are, those are my interests. So the, the biggest challenge I have with these two is that they were both done in the 17th century, as far as we know. I have a good date on this image. This is actually a, um, a picture that I took in the Netherlands at the Rijksmuseum. It's probably part of their digital collection as well if you want to find better details. But you know, I, I took a good look at it. And one of the things I was focused in early as I was looking as I was trying to figure out if that hand had been refinished. And I decided it's actually realistic enough looking for my purposes. Um, but so this is one. This is an image that came across in the Facebook group. Uh, we did a reverse image search on it. And what we found is that it belongs to the Folger Shakespeare Library, but we had no clear date on it at the time. And we were looking at the clothing and thinking it was probably towards the end of what we were looking at, end of the period, but we didn't have a clear date. So I went ahead and messaged off to the librarian and she sent back the notes that they had on this particular um, series of books. And there's several of them. This is actually just the one coach out of it. They don't have a lot of details on it, what they do know is that it was probably by an Italian artist between 1603 and 1625, uh, which would fit with the idea of it being in the times of James the first. So that's always a starting place when you're looking at art and you're trying to focus in on a time period. If your personal goal is to get image from any time, then the dates don't matter as much. If you're trying to narrow down to a practice down to a specific time frame, then trying to go through and date the artistic work that you're working from is sometimes the next challenge that comes in. One of my best bits of advice is you start to build your own collection, whether you throw it in with ours or you build it somewhere else. Try to include dates and places with your images as much as possible. I've, I've spent a lot of time from early on in my research career, I'm like, oh, I have this great image. Oh, where did it come from? Um, but if you include it in a way that you can find it again in Google or include it away where that information is easy there, then when you're going on and you're showing people your evidence or you're writing documentation or you're just having a conversation with a friend who's interested, you have it all there and it's easy to pass along. So the next thing I want to look at, this was actually, and hopefully that's showing up for you guys, move you over here. Um, this, is, this is sort of our next piece. So we started for our very early 17th century pieces that were painted by artists who lived in the very tail end of the 16th century. So that's within what some people are looking at. Uh, and those horses were actually in open bridles. And, and very commonly, you guys might have noticed this during Rachel's presentation, very commonly, the horses in the time periods we're looking at are being driven open. They don't have blinkers on their bridles. And whether they are being ridden in the saddle or not, they typically have these in place. So if we go and we look at the reasons that blinkers are used, the, the reasons we've been given over the years for why they're used, one of them is the idea of, oh, it's blocking the view of the carriage wheels. Well, we know that we can train the horses not to see that because we know it's possible or, or not to react to that because we know it's uh, it's possible to drive horses open. The, the two things that I've always thought were a little more plausible um, and certainly fit my personal experience, both come back from driving multiples. When you're driving multiples, your whiplash becomes an issue because either you're sending your lash up and over and you might accidentally hit a horse in the eye so these become armor for the horse to protect from errant shots. Or if you got your lazy, your, 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 your good near horse and your lazy, uh, excuse me, your good off horse, your lazy near horse, and you're coming up and over on your pair, your one horse is constantly seeing that whiplash flip up through the air over to hit their friend. And so you can occasionally get a horse that starts jumping, even though they're not the one being hit, because whenever you have a pair, there's always one willing to work and one willing to let them. That's what we call a willing pair. So. 
I think that that at least is, as we look at the later time period and look at our more modern driving, those are the reasons we use it then. I don't see much evidence of them in the SCA's time period. Um, there are a few. You can see we've got one right here. If we look over here, and this is the, the uh, fresco from Monte Castel Monta. Um, this is actually one of the first images that we found with blinkers as Rachel and I were doing research. So we went ahead and I clarified with the museum that that was not a retouching. Sometimes these places that are beautiful medieval or Gothic palaces are redone in the 17th and 18th century and the images will be, will be changed around. So uh, we did clarify, this has been um, updated a little bit, but they said that they have left all of the original colors and all of the original designs. So those particular blinkers should be in place. And then after the fact, we found this. So that's one of the other techniques when you are working from art is being able to find the same thing in multiple places. Um, I'm a big fan of, of, if I can find it at least three times within the same time free period, maybe within the same geography, then I start to feel pretty comfortable that that's evidence that's real and not something that's artifact as often. Um, go ahead. So that takes us to another foible that's out there. When we were having the discussion on blinkers, we had several folks submit um, some images that were Egyptian in style that had this piece here. And in some, they look like they come over the eye and some they seem like they're a decorative, decorative brow band. There's a gold piece that kind of stands out here. And then there's actually a blue brow band that goes underneath it. So there was a question. And in some of the reconstructions, you can see these done out almost like a small blinker. Uh, so perhaps in that earlier time period, the, the blinkers were used, uh, but there is one question on this. When we look at this, it doesn't quite have the right Egyp Egyptian style and age to me. So we dug back a little bit further, and this is a photo of one of the painted boxes from Tutankhamun's tomb. And we've got that same, little gold image right there. It's a little pixelated on my screen, uh, but, but there is that small little gold blinker-like image, which could very easily be part of the harness. Uh, we have the reins are coming back and they're tied off here, uh, much like we see the reins tied off there. I want to take a brief moment as you see the driver tied to their horses to point out that this is a discussion of period artwork. This is not a discussion of safe SCA driving. That's a whole different conversation. Um, but when you start to look at some of the period options that are there, here is a little bit better known redrawing. This is actually um, from a 19th century redrawing. And we start to see some of those elements. We've got the, the detailed blinkers here. We have, looks like almost some sort of a check rein going back there down low. We have the reins are coming down probably through some turrets back to here. The, the guy is holding it in his hand. Uh, as a contrast, so this is, whenever you get a redrawing, you might lose some details. In a contrast, this is a photo of the, ooh, hey, that didn't do what I wanted it to. There we go. My chat got big and covered everything for me. So this is a photo from one of the reliefs on one of the temples. So we're getting back into some period artwork as opposed to a 19th century redrawing. And again, we have see, we have documentation for that rain tied around the waist that we had on the earlier hey, redrawing. She's trying to get on Tutankhamun's door when I earlier. The first door and I couldn't get the second door open because she's we trying have, to get uh, archers <laughs> going ahead and <laughs> loosing arrows. So again, this is a, not, not the approved way to be doing chariot archery at this point, but this is an example of things that they did. And I think we're having some mute challenges. Did somebody have a question? Okay, we'll go ahead and go on to the next little bit then. So when you start to look at places you can go to get images, um, 
as you're looking through period works, I, I have a whole host of friends that, that send me things as they, they come across things in their research, which is fantastic. They send me all their good horse stuff. Uh, this was actually a work that I was introduced to by a friend of mine who does a Swedish persona. And what it is, it is, it is a 16th century work that is a history of the Northern people done in, written in Latin, uh, but it has some amazing images in it. And because it's the North, they have a lot of sleighs and sled use. Uh, these, I have just two of them pictured here. And part of the reason I use these two is we're getting, here's a nice 16th century thing where again, we have that reins in the left hand, whip up in place. Um, these particular ones, as far as I can tell from these images, these are not the best copies of them. It was, uh, the, there was writing on the backside when I did the scan, but these are in open bridles, um, single horses. We can see back here that this person appears to be standing and they're holding on to the vehicle. I'm kind of wondering if this one is seated on some sort of a platform, like I've seen on some of the, the extant 17th century sleighs. We'll have a sort of half sit, half straddle platform for the driver to be on at the back of the vehicle. Um, so I think that might be what's going on here. So, so here we are, we're firmly in the 16th century. We've got something that starts to look kind of like the driving that I'm used to and, and gives me some evidence for that. There's there's a few pieces missing. Yeah, I'm not entirely certain how this is stopping unless the, the poles are um, in nice and tight to the collar somehow. Uh, I'd like to see a little more detail on that one. But, but I'm at least starting to get some images that are starting to look in my mind's eye like what I grew up with as a driver. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and jump back a little bit further. Um, and I sort of jumped over that time period that Rachel already addressed, where she talked about there was some loss of some of the Roman technology, both in terms of the roads and in terms of the vehicle suspension, as far as we've been able to find. Um, and so if we want to keep with the idea of driven vehicles versus um, postillion vehicles, we're going to go back. And this starts to introduce another couple things. As you skip through multiple eras of art, as well as multiple styles of art, there are some conventions that come into play. Um, Book of Hours is gonna have a slightly different set of conventions than a Bible, than an allegorical work, than a miniature, than portraiture does. And so each of those areas is gonna bring you a little bit different information. And you may find that you need to either develop a little bit of an art history background, not a lot, just a little, or reach out to your friends who already have one. Um, I tend to find that uh, I, I get, set, get some great collaboration going with my friends who do a lot of early research on, they'll have a horse question, they'll send it to me. I'll have a question about you know, clothing or practice in the early period and this thing that I'm seeing and gee, which one of these works is allegorical and they'll be able to answer that question for me. So if your primary focus is on being able to ride your horse and do some art to, to support that or drive your horse, um, being able to develop research partnerships is very, very, very helpful. So in this particular work, this is out of uh, Psychomachia. So we're, we're looking at something that's fairly allegorical. You might note that the horse has two heads. Um, I, my guess is that they are trying, because the reins, I don't think that's one ride rein, maybe that's four reins. Um, they may be trying to demonstrate a pair here, and that just wasn't part of the convention of the art for this particular artist, uh, because we only have, maybe they're a very well matched pair, so you know they're moving like they only have four legs instead of eight legs, but we still have the two heads around here. So. We're going to go ahead and take that one with a little bit of grain of salt. I don't think they necessarily drove two-headed horses, but I can't disprove it at this moment. Uh, if we come over here, we have a figure who's standing. We have three horses. We have at least three reins going back to the driver's hand. So that gives us some suggestions. Uh, he's standing up on the vehicle. The angle is a little interesting in terms of where the ponies are. And there may or may not be some scale issues in this particular drawing. Uh, some, some art schools, uh, some art groupings 
we're very big into using scale that would match what we think of as a photograph. Others scale was a little more of a vague understanding. So a little bit of space there. So we start to get into the 13th century. Uh, and when we start to look at a Bible, we've got a couple things going on in this particular image. We do have um, oxen hitched here. The oxen seem to be used based on other records. They were used extensively for farming uh, in the British Isles. Uh, and we have what I assume is some kind of jerk line. I think you guys will need to make, or at least I'll follow up with, we'll check with our oxen expert later in the day. That is not what I drive. Um, but we do seem to have the ability to control the draft animals from the vehicle in this particular 13th century work. This is from the same work. And in this particular case, we've got the horses uh, and they are hitched and we have a rider who is sitting on the horse and controlling both horses. And again, you can see the lack of blinkers on these guys. So a little bit different than the, the practices that we're all much more accustomed to. Okay, I'm gonna take a minute. This is actually, there's a couple of good things going on in here. This is another one where we have horses, ponies that are set up to be ridden, but I'm not always certain that's what's happening for some of these. In, in a number of the images of this size, what we will find is we will find uh, small, what look to be small children based on scale on ponies. These seem like maybe they are slightly larger men that are that are involved in the driving. There was a question during Rachel's class about litters. Um, and I actually really like this particular uh, image for that because it's set up very similar to some of the litter images that I've looked at. We've got a, a very wide strap that comes up over the saddle. The saddle's probably similar in design, the, the tree is probably similar in design to how we would think of a pack saddle, but the, basically the weight is going up over the saddle and the shafts are there. It doesn't matter so much when you've got a cart like this that, that's good and level and presumably balanced. You're not going to take a tremendous amount of weight on the horse's back. When you start to look at a litter where the weight is not being carried by the wheels, of the vehicle. Instead, it is being carried by the two animals that are bearing it. You need to have that wider surface area to distribute the weight. So something thin like a driving saddle might not be adequate, even in the same way that a gig saddle is much wider than a fine harness saddle because it's a much heavier vehicle. You're going to see that amplified even more when you start to talk about litters. And you'll, you'll see that repeated in a number of the images that are out there. Even down to the litters often have a breast collar arrangement that will come back and hook back to something that starts to look almost like footman's loops where it all ties into here and you're using that not only to keep the horse from stepping away from the litter but also i think to provide some braking power um, in and i think that's what you're seeing with the straps here this one even seems to come down around and fasten underneath somewhere so you've got something that's holding your your shafts down um, almost like some sort of a tug strap or a wrap strap, except it's all a single piece, which starts to make it a little more functional, though this is a four wheel vehicle, so we don't have the same issues with tipping, but we've got our traces are running there. So that's our forward. This is probably providing our braking and we've got our breaching not only going up to the saddle, but we do actually have the breaching on this particular one connecting back to the shafts. So, it starts to be reasonable that the horse at least is starting to, even though they're set up for riding, they're starting to use themselves much more like what we expect from our driving horses, where we expect them to be the forward and the braking. I know there was a, a question during the previous, uh, previous presentation on did it take less training or a hypothesis that it took less training to teach people to ride because they already knew that than it did to drive. I, I'd love, if you've got written documentation for that, please send me, because I'd love to see it. It's, it's really hard to find written documentation for these things that are attributable back to period sources. Um, but my working theory, being a, a rider and a driver, is it's not a whole lot different as long as you understand how the technology works. Um, 
most of these vehicles, particularly the four wheeled ones, they'll turn, but they're not designed for tight turns. This one has a similar suspension system to or um, support system to that Hungarian farm wagon that Rachel was talking about. So one of our other take home messages on this particular one is I, I get some questions from time to time about scale. And I think if she's still on, we actually have uh, Angel's mom, but this is Angel of the Tiny Hooves from Kaid. Uh, and this is my husband who is six foot three. And there was a question related to this work about, can we tell how tall this pony is? as we're starting, so we can get ideas about things like as we're selecting our driving animals for recreation, what sorts of animals, what sizes of animals did they use? Um, we're able to go through, there's actually some archeological work that's been done on humans that found that humans then were, human males then were about the same size as human males are now. And from that, we were able to calculate average inseam sizes and give us the idea that our 15th century pony up here was probably in the ballpark of 29 to, to 31 inches, maybe a little bit taller. There's That's assuming everything was done to some sort of a scale, but you certainly start to see that there's enough pulling power there. They could have used some smaller animals and gives some support and justification for those who are using their very small equines to do driving in the SCA. Ma'am? Is a question? Oh, yes. Um, a, a comment. Yeah. I'm the one that made the comment in the previous class about it might be easier if you put a rider on and get them driving. I did not have any Yeah. That would be fantastic if you could. I, I think what you said, I'm you were breaking up a little, but I believe what you said was you got it from another group and you're gonna forward the you're gonna send the question back to them and see if you can get me documentation. Uh yes, I think that was it what is I heard. Book about um it's a, a book written by an author who's really good about checking things really if the lawyer or being sort of hey paying bills. So yeah. I awesome. someone in the group, if not awesome. himself, can find and give us a back up. Oh, you're the best. Love you. Yay, resources. <laughs> uh, Thank you very much. So one, one other thing I want to touch on while I'm on this particular slide. Um, much as Rachel mentioned in hers, I, I will say for, for those of us who English is our first language, I think we often fall to looking almost sometimes regardless of where our persona is, we often fall to looking to the works out of Great Britain, maybe we venture into France. Um, and I don't know that those are the most fertile areas for looking for driving art and vehicle art. I think that Great Britain in particular used a lot of packing for transportation. And I don't find the same sort of resources out of there that I do when I look to other portions of Europe. You'll notice that a lot of the things that I have saved have very Germanic titles on them. I've had much better research as I start, much better luck with research as I start to look to some of the German museums, some of the uh, Austrian museums, the Hungarian museums. So much better art has come up that's useful for the sorts of things I'm interested in. Um, so. That would be another general suggestion for folks. Okay, so we start to look at practical resources. And, and this is one of the thing. I, I liked the fact that Rachel's talk was really about luxury vehicles and hit upon the idea of what the nobility does, because that's what a lot of us strive to recreate for the most part in the SCA. What we have beyond that is we when we're looking at things like transportation and driving technology and that sort of things, uh, occasionally we're going to find some more humble origins. Uh, this is a nice example of a sled. This does not appear to be on snow as far as I can tell. We're just pulling, pulling a sled across ground for a working animal. And this is actually from a 16th century mining guide. Um, for those of you with dog interests, there's actually some neat examples of pack dogs in the back as well. Yeah, yeah, Sweden and Germany, 
Italy, all those are all fantastic. Um, yeah, Thora, I will drop my uh, my email in the chat at the end of the talk. So, um, when we've got this piece here, the other thing in terms of, you know, I talk about looking into details and some of the practical guides and, and stuff that isn't necessarily driving it first blush. Um, here's an example of, we're gonna assume maybe there wasn't dragging killing while somebody was plowing, but here's a chance for you guys to see what somebody might've done with plowing and interpret from there. So there, there's a lot of areas you can dig into and get more information. Uh, here is a piece that I particularly like from the Czech Republic. Uh, again, in this one, this is a battle scene from a Bible. So kind of a, a mix of images and there may be a little bit of artistic interpretation going on here, but we can at least get the idea of some harnessing details uh, and get an idea where we want to go from there. What I particularly like about this one is they do give an example often when we've got the pairs that are being ridden, they only show the rider holding the reins of the horse that he's on. I do like the fact that in this one, he does have the reins of the horse next to him too. So we can maybe start to make some guesses in how they would have accomplished directing the adjacent animal. Let's go over here. Uh, this is a nice example where we can look at the double tree and the way that the pair is set up. We can see that this isn't Yet another one of our written examples, there are no lines that are coming back to our folks on our vehicle. So, but that fits. We're right here at the beginning of the 15th century in Germany. So that's fitting with, with what we see for the most part in those time periods. And then we get to go in and talk about some of my favorite hitches. Um, I personally, tandem is my favorite thing to drive. And so we've got some examples of tandems and randoms here. Again, unlike our earlier tandem pictures, these are being driven open even on the wheelers. Uh, and they are, we do again have the riders seated upon the draft animals. And, but it gives you some evidence of yes, this hitch happened. My personal hypothesis on where this might have been an advantage is if you've got some narrow roadways and you need a little, little extra horsepower. This gives you a way of putting them in draft and sending them to work and getting those extra things accomplished uh, without having to change your vehicle that's maybe set up for a single most of the time. You can go ahead and add that little bit of extra power that you need just some of the time. We'll return to that idea in a moment. And one last little bit as we're talking about multiples for the places where you've decided you don't need the long string of horses out in front of you, but you want that extra horsepower. We do have some lovely sixth through eighth century examples of horses being driven for abreast. Um, I in particular like this piece because we actually have the reins going, actually both of these, you actually start to see the, the beginnings of what could be some coupling reins. I really wish the groom would take these two and pull their head apart so I could see what was going on between the two of them. I also spend a lot of time yelling turn around at what woodcuts. It hasn't gotten me anywhere yet. But we can start to go back and look and see what we've got in place. And on this first image, we can see that he's got the four lines back to his hands. And he's got them basically bridged in his right hand and his left hand. Um, uh, yes, Helen, one of those dogs does, does appear to have a saddle on on the right hand side of that image. Uh, so he's got the reins in both the left and the right hand. This is a, not an uncommon posture for a CDE or a obstacles driver in pleasure driving. I've certainly gotten more than one four and a hand around this way. Um, so we do see the beginnings of that. And there's your documentation. When somebody asks you if you can drive like that, you go, oh yeah, I've got this Greek vase that says I can do it. So there you go. Uh, then we get into, this is actually probably the woodcut I spend the most time yelling at telling them to turn around um, because there'll be this great detail and I'm looking at the costuming and I just want to see what they're doing on the back and they may not give me that image. But it's also phenomenal because it was a triumphal procession loaded with triumphal coaches, which we actually have English translation for the sixth, early 16th century dictations on how they wanted the artwork to look. 
um, actually becomes a somewhat valuable work. The, the downside is that it's allegorical and it never happened. So you have to take a few things with, grain, with a grain of salt when you're looking at these works. For example, I don't know that anyone ever pulled a three or four breasts together and directed them just with a single line. Um, there may be some more there, or maybe when you're an angel, you can accomplish anything. Um, but what I do like this for is when I'm trying to come up with pretty ideas for doing barding and trying to make barding work for a driven animal, there's some great examples in this image. Um, I also get a little concerned about the, uh, the lack of stoppability on this particular hitch. So there are a lot of examples of different draft animals that are out there as you, you start to dig through the artistic work. This particular one, you'll see that they refer to elks. I think most of the North Americans on this call would call these moose. Uh, that's where it's fun to do some cross studying. I have a friend who is a linguist and she has a phenomenal rant talking about how uh, the reason the plural of moose is moose goes back to the fact that moose is an Algonquin word and that when the Europeans came over to the northeast they named really big deer elk and then they found that there were bigger deer out there that looked like the elk they knew and so they took the algonquin word for moose and they used that in english so these are what we as north americans would think of as moose but they are being called elk because in europe they're going to think of those as elk um, i don't know that anyone ever drove moose I have a moose, he's not broke to drive. It's spelled differently. Um, and if they did, I'd like to think they probably had some means of directing them, but these guys are absolutely fabulous and stunning. And some days you just wanna recreate art and literature. Uh, I think we had some dog interested folks on there. These are actually just a couple of examples. There's a whole big album of dog stuff, mostly Rachel's research in the Facebook group. Uh, we can see that we have a nice 14th century example of maybe we have some interesting scale issues or angle issues there. Perspective, I think that's the arts word. Uh, we also have a lovely fantasy image of a dog chariot from the late 4th century. Um, but again, we've got some, some things that begins to, to me at least sort of looks like a greyhound, looks like a, a sighthound that's going to go out and do some running. Um, so those become become stuff that actually can be kind of useful and fun. And I need to speed up because I only have 10 minutes left. Uh, here we have a plow. And, and the thing that I find interesting is this. So obviously he's leading this uh, draft animal, probably a donkey. Good to know European moose are smaller and have a better disposition. The, the orthans try to keep me away from the moose. What I like about this one, and this will become important at the next set of images I show you, but you can see that the lines are running back here to the plow themselves. Um, we've got some oxen plowing there as well. So this is the image that, that Rachel showed. And this was, this was kind of one of those early ones because you would see this posted on blogs and you would hear tales of 15th century accounts about these male coaches that started in the time of Matthias I of Hungary and how much ground that they could cover and how it was amazing and it was a very smooth ride and people would actually even men would pay to travel on these vehicles because it was such a pleasant ride and they would get the mail around and this was the image we had and you would hear references to a stamp all of this supposedly was in in hungarian i guess i could never track it down i actually this week found an image of the Hungarian stamp that I've been hearing about over the years. So I'm going to go back and point out a couple things in this image to you guys. I want to point out to you the wheel shape. And this was freely said it was a redrawing, but the wheel shape here, you've got kind of the hand position here and the post back there. So we have, this is that uh, redrawing of the period work by Schummel in 1977. So we've got kind of lines going. The line seemed to come back to his hand. It almost looks like he's got some sort of a rain bridge right there that he's using. But again, this is actually the original work by Schemmel in the 16th century. 
In this one, to me, I do think it's interesting that we seem to have the reins coming back and being tied off in some sort of a coupling arrangement at about the same place for all three horses. This rein is clearly tied off to the vehicle like our plow was. And I actually, the hand is up in a position where it could be holding a rein, but I see the reins as going back to the vehicle, which makes me wonder if he's if these horses were basically pushed forward up into the bridle, and in order to get individual control, he would reach across with this hand. This is all supposition. He would reach across with this hand and do the things he needed to do. These were male vehicles. These were the equivalent of, uh, they could turn. We looked a little bit at the way the, the systems are set up, um, but mostly they probably went straight. There are some uh, extant account, written accounts on these that I actually have a copy of in Hungarian. So that's my project for later in the summer to get a better translation of those. This is a diagram from a paper that was done in 1992 during the reconstruction. I've gotten a little off of art here, but I do wanna show you guys, I've, I've been chasing this image for a while. This is actually the reproduction in the museum in the town. It was closed on the Monday that I was there because I was driving from Vienna to Budapest. So when I make it back to Budapest, I'm gonna make it back to the museum, not on a Monday. And we'll see if we can get some more information on these bits and pieces. And my last little bit, uh, before I open up for any questions that we have left. Oh, good, no rush. <laughs> um, so this is my last little bit. And I wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions at the end. Um, I know that there are some folks out there that have ROM personas and are looking at how to integrate horse culture to that. I thought that Rachel taught a great class looking at the luxury travel, travel wagons and addressing those who want to use some, want to create or use a vehicle for camping purposes. Um, this is actually one of the few images that I know of, of what would have been the Romani culture, um, labeled as the Bohemians at the time. And this dates back to the very early 17th century. My understanding, and this is not an area I've researched highly, but my understanding is that this would have, they carried a lot of their equipment in there. Um, and then they would have used the underneath of this vehicle is a structure would have been tented over. I'm not seeing any supports on that particular one. And again, we're seeing that same idea of that riding in a pack type saddle. You actually see the, the bracings of the pack saddle coming underneath and providing the support there as well. Um, and apparently we are just magic and we don't actually need anything to direct our horse. He's very good and he goes where he needs to do. I need a horse that's that well behaved. So with all that done, that was the prepared slides I had. Did we have anyone who had any questions that I wasn't able to address or didn't catch in the chat as we were going? Feel free to unmute and ask. Thank you very much for that presentation. It's the first time I've seen um, this particular one and there was quite a few interesting images in there. Thank you. If we don't have anybody that has any questions, I will go ahead and uh, Thor, I'll send you a copy of my email. And thank you guys so much. I'm, I'm always happy to get information back the other directions.